but I would I would draw the attention of people that are interested that there are at least three candidates for president who are ready to go further. One of them is Marianne Williamson, who's running inside the Democratic Party. Uh, and then there are two that are running outside, Cornell West and uh, Jill Stein. And yes, they are not going to win. And yes, they are small, underfunded efforts. But they are there and they are a sign that there are, as everybody knows, millions of Americans who feel very unrepresented. And remember, it used to be the unions that provided the mass ground support for the Democratic Party. But if you destroy the unions, they don't have as many staff people. They can't help you in each district. So the irony was the Democratic Party, who helped to destroy the labor movement, had to turn instead to wealthy donors. If you read the Financial Times about China, and if you read the New York Times about China. Hello and welcome to another episode of India and Global Left. Today we have with us Professor Richard Wolf. Uh, Professor Wolf, welcome to Indian Global Left. I would say welcome back to Indian Global Left. Very good. It's very happy for me to be back. All right. We have a lot to discuss. I want, wanted to discuss with you uh, a little bit about the U.S. economy, uh, a little bit on China, and finally, if time permits, we discuss a little bit about socialism. Okay. So that's the broad agenda. <clears throat> I want to start with the U.S. labor movement. A Bloomberg report says that in 2023 alone, there are 307 work uh, stoppages and 485,000 U.S. workers have gone on in strike. We are hearing a lot about the United Auto Workers, but it's all over the place. Uh, so much so that Biden, even Biden, who claims himself to be the most pro-worker president in United States history has to walk a picket line. Walk us through some of the new developments of the U.S. labor movement and probably tell us a little bit about how the U.S. labor movement was smashed in the 1980s. Okay. Um, first of all, let me make clear that uh, Bloomberg is correct. There is uh, no question now that there is an upsurge in the labor movement uh, the likes of which we probably have not seen uh, in many decades. So this is a very big, uh, momentous historical change. Uh, it's been going on now for two years, I would say, at least. Um, and it, it, all that time, many of us wondered whether it would continue, whether it was sustainable, whether it would grow. And so far, I am happy to report, it has grown, it has been sustained, and it looks to grow uh, for sure uh, into 2024 and probably beyond. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing is that it marks in many ways a reversal of what happened to the labor movement over the last 75 years. In many ways, the labor movement of the United States peaked in the Great Depression and in the immediate years thereafter. I'm talking the 1930s into the 1940s, the, the years of World War II, and peaked around the middle of the 1950s. This is uh, during least, Eisenhower administration. That's right. Uh, and, be, and we say that because roughly, just roughly, a third, a third of American workers back then were members of a union. And never a majority, uh, just to keep the perspective clear here, but very powerful, particularly in the 1930s, when there was an alliance, which was very powerful in the United States, and which teaches all kinds of lessons that need to be learned, especially now because we have a labor resurgence. Here are the lessons. When the Great Depression hit in 1929 and the collapse of capitalism unfolded, and let me stress for those who whose history is perhaps a little rusty, uh, how bad it was. 
Between... That's not unusual, given yeah. how bad all our education is all That's over the right. world. Yes. That's right. Between 1929 and 1933, the collapse of the American economy could be shown by a line that goes catastrophically down without interruption. So that by 1933, the official unemployment rate, definitely an undercounting, but nonetheless, the, the official unemployment rate was 25%. In other words, one in four workers was out of work. Uh, this means that no American family was untouched by the unemployment rate. Either your mother, your father, your cousin, your uncle, your aunt, uh, somebody was out of work. And remember, there was no unemployment insurance at that time. So when a, when a member of your family lost a job, that person became a burden on the rest of the family at a time when wages were shrinking, when opportunity was collapsing. It was a level of suffering of the American working class, which was awful and was worse than awful because there had been no preparation before it. For decades before 1929, the economics profession, my profession, the professors, the economic writers had been telling every American that we lived in a charmed country that could only go up, that we were the richest and the most, blah, blah, blah. All of this kind of thinking, there was no story that we had to worry about the business cycle that we had to worry that it could be a very long and deep downturn. And it started in October of 1929, and it wasn't over until the beginning of 1941. So you, you, you get an idea. You're plunging an economy with no preparation into over a decade of serious economic crisis. And in that situation, the American working class moved sharply to the political left. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again, sharply to the political left. Number one, the labor movement split between the old craft unions organized in something called the American Federation of Labor, AFL, that fell to the side and a brand new labor movement emerged out of the mining industry, the United Mine Workers, and they set up something called the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And they set out not to organize the old craft industries in the manner of the AFL, but rather the new exploding mass production uh, industries. And they organized all the workers in an industry, highly skilled, no skill, little skill, and so forth. Extraordinarily successful. In a few years, tens of millions of American workers joined unions. These were workers who had never been in a union before whose parents had never been in a union before, who had no experience with unions. It was the greatest, most successful union drive in the history of the United States. There had been nothing like it before, and there has been nothing like it since, with the possible, not yet definite, possible exception of now. That's, again, to give you an idea yeah. of how oh. momentous mm -hmm. all of this really is. Anyway, they achieved fantastic results because of an alliance between the CIO, the union movement, two socialist parties, and one communist party, who also exploded with growing memberships in the 1930s, tens of thousands 
of young people, but older people too, joining the socialist and communist parties and working as the vanguard, if you like, the militants in and for the unions. In any case, it came to be called the New Deal Coalition. Unions, socialists, communists. And they went to the then sitting middle of the road president. Think of him as a younger Joe Biden, more or less what we have now. Only his name was Franklin Roosevelt, FDR. And they went to him and they basically said to him, we now represent 30 to 40 million Americans. By, sorry, by Joe Biden, did you mean like he was not necessarily a very pro-labor pro person to begin with? That's right. Not at all. He was a centrist. Um, he was a Democrat in the mold of Clinton or Obama or Biden or all of that. You know, in the middle, no progressive anything particular. Uh, when Roosevelt ran and became president, uh, he ran on a balanced budget that mm -hmm. the government should spend only as much as it took in. In other words, not to solve a social problem, but to keep a budget balanced. And, and that, that continued throughout the 30s, right, if I'm not mistaken? No, only no. the war... Okay. It changed. It changed. That's the important thing. So the unions and the socialists and the communists went to Roosevelt, said that they represented 30 to 40 million Americans. And they basically said to him, we need you to help the American people through this depression. They are suffering terribly and all. Everybody knew it. There were demonstrations in the streets, usually led by socialists, communists, and all the rest in every major city. Uh, it was the headline in the newspaper every other day. There were clashes with the police and so forth. And radio was coming up. Yes, radio was coming up, not, not yet television. So they went to him and they said, you have to help us. If you don't help us, we won't vote for you. And you will not be the president. And that's the end of your political career. If you do help us, we will become cheerleaders for you. We will go around the community showing that you saved everybody from this awful depression. That was the deal. And Mr. Roosevelt, for his part, let's be fair, was a smart enough politician to understand that this was not a bluff. This was the genuine intention and the capability of this powerful left-wing coalition that had formed in response to the collapse of 1929. His only request was, I will do what you ask, but I need you to commit, particularly those of you that are socialists and communists, I don't want to hear any more about a revolution here in the United States. Remember, we're in the 1920s and 30s. That's not very many years after 1917 in Russia. So everybody has in their mind where things might go. And so that's the deal. I will give you, but you must put aside your revolutionary politics. This deal was accepted by the socialists and the communists. There were some who didn't. There was debate and disagreement, but the deal was accepted. The socialism and the communism were downplayed, not 100%, but downplayed. And for his part, Mr. Roosevelt, just so people have a feeling for it, created, and remember this is at a time when the government has no money because millions of people are unemployed. Those people pay no taxes. 
Tens of thousands of businesses are bankrupt. They pay no taxes. So the revenue base of the country is collapsed. Nonetheless, the power of that left-wing coalition gets the president to announce in the de depths of that depression, early to middle 1930s, the social security system. Never before had the United States had a national pension system. It was created in the depression. It was created and it was said by the president, anyone who reaches the age of 65 after a lifetime of work will be able to retire and the government will give you a check every month for the rest of your life, no matter how long you live. Never been done in American history before, nothing like it had ever been done, no commitment to the mass of people economically ever made like that. Amazing. Number two, an unemployment compensation system at the federal level for the whole country. If you lose your job through no fault of your own, the government will give you a check every week for a year or two to help you through this awful depression. Number three, the first minimum wage law ever mm. passed in the United States, guaranteeing that an employer had to pay you a livable minimum, it would be an illegal act to pay you less. And number four, a federal jobs program. The president went on the radio, said to the American people, if the, not in these words, but here's the point, if the private capitalist sector either cannot or will not give a job to millions of people who ask only to be given a job, then I as president will do so. And the federal government hired 10 to 15, depending on how you count, million unemployed people, gave them an income and gave them a secure job. This was uh, through investment in infrastructure, public work, and so on. Among other things, that's right. But there were other things. For example, the most, <clears throat> most ambitious arts program in the mm -hmm. history of the United States called the WPA, oh, if people are interested, in which artists, unemployed artists, were hired by the government by the thousands, painters, sculptors, singers, actors, musicians, and, yeah, all, and then they were formed into groups and they moved around the country providing concerts, classes, lessons, performances, particularly in areas that were poor and that never had had live cultural activity presented for them by the government at no cost. This was a remarkable program and there were others like it. It's one of the great creative moments and it's important to understand it only happened when and because capitalism failed, not because it succeeded. It was out of the failure and the government being brought in to rescue a broken, failed capitalism that we could have the cultural explosion that we did. Plus the earliest ecological, the earliest environmental Mental. swamps Swamp. cleared and, and the national, national parks. Box that are very popular in this country were built by that labor and on and on. It was just remarkable. Okay. How was all of this paid for if the government had no money? Answer. Roosevelt went to where the money was and the money was in the hands of corporations and the rich. And he said to them, you have a choice. 
I want you to give me a significant portion of your wealth, either in the form of raised taxes or in the form of loans you're going to give me or some combination. And it ended up being a combination. He said, I I'm asking you for that, but I'm also here to tell you that if you don't give it to me, and therefore I cannot do for the mass of people, there is a serious risk that you will soon have no money to give anybody at all. In other words, the president, president of the United yeah. States conveyed an implicit threat. And that convinced about half of the ruling class, the rich, to cooperate. The other half have become the extreme right wing that is now funding Trump and all of that. We've always, we've never gotten rid of that. They've always been there. But enough of them understood the threat that Roosevelt was able to pass the legislation, including the tax increases that were necessary to fund social security, unemployment, compensation, and all the rest. Which means that by the time the war breaks out, 1940, 41, 42, we have a remarkable moment in American history. We've had 10 years of left-wing government because the New Deal, that's what the name of the whole program was called, the New Deal Coalition, CIO, two socialist parties and a communist party, had lived up to their part of the bargain. They had re-elected Roosevelt three times. He was the most popular president in American history. No president had, since George Washington, no president had been re-elected three times in American history. So, can you have a left wing in the United States? Answer, yes, we've had it. Can the left wing be popular? Yes, we've had it. Can it be the most popular more than anything on the right? Yes, we've had it. Anyone who suggests that the United States cannot be such a, a social force does not know the history of the country. The country. But now, now get, to get to your point, once, once the, the war, war was over, uh, by the way, the war made it even more yeah. urgent for the ruling class because the enemy were the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese, Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo in Japan. And these yeah. were fascists. So the United States allied with the Soviet Union. Very important. Americans, many Americans don't know this, don't even have in their heads the history that from 1940, basically to 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union were in an alliance to fight fascism which meant that the business community was horrified. They had been taxed like never before to provide mass support to the working class like never before and had a foreign policy alliance with communist Russia at the same time. It was perceived by the American capitalist class as an existential threat. So starting in 1945, the war is over. Roosevelt dies. The depression is over because the millions of unemployed had either been helped by the government or put into the military to fight the war or both. So now was the chance 
to counterattack, to mobilize the business community, conservatives, religious fundamentalists, all of that, to push back against what had happened between 1929 and 1945. And we had a rolling back of the New Deal, literally an undoing of the New Deal that started immediately after the war, 1945, and at least as far as the right wing in America is concerned, has never stopped, is continuing as I speak to you. The first step was to identify the problem. And what the business community here did was identify that the New Deal coalition was the problem. They knew that without that coalition pressuring from below, the President Roosevelt wouldn't have done most of what he did. So they knew the president wasn't a problem. He was dead anyway. But they knew the coalition could do to the next president, Truman or Eisenhower, who came later, the same thing that they had done to Roosevelt. So you had to destroy the coalition. And the way to do that was to identify the weak link of that coalition. And the identified weak link was the Communist Party of the United States. And the, the stri strategic plan was the following. Number one, attack the Communist Party on the grounds that it wasn't militant, that it wasn't the leader of the Union drives, that it wasn't the, by far the leader in, in fighting the anti-Black racism that has been in this country since its beginning. No, no, they were the evil agents of the Soviet Union. They were the agents of a foreign power. And when you and then you arrested them, you deported them, all of that was done. And then the two socialist parties were attacked because, because Americans were told that socialism is exactly the same thing as communism. They just spell the word differently, which is why to this day, large numbers of Americans cannot understand any difference between socialism and communism. They use these words as synonyms and throw in anarchism, Marxism, liberalism, it's all one evil, bad thing. They hate Keynes as much as Marx, and mm -hmm. they really can't tell you much about the difference between them. This is not stupidity. This is a product of this particular history that was imposed on them. And when they had destroyed the communists and the socialists, they went after the labor movement. First, they made it illegal for an officer of the labor movement to be a member of the Communist Party. That became a law. Right. You, the workers could not elect, elect. a communist. Did it start around 1948? Like, that's uh, right. That begins in a very famous law called the Taft-Hartley Act of 19... It's either 47 or 48. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um and so the unions were attacked, uh, either on grounds of being communist or being somehow socialist, somehow un-American. That became a word, un-American. And so they've been declining for the last 70 years. It's extraordinary. Let me give you the numbers. From being one-third of the for labor force, organized in a union. Today, it's about 10%. So that's an unbelievable drop. And if, if you disaggregate, you break down the 10%, roughly 6% six, 6 of the private sector workers are now represented by a union. 94% of the millions of workers 
that work for private employers are not members of and are not represented by a union. Uh, the unionization rate is significantly higher in public right. employees, you know, school teachers, uh, firefighters, the clerks that manage what the government does. There you still have, I don't know the exact numbers, but between 25 and 30 percent of the public sector employees are unionized. But the union movement is much, much weaker and has gotten weaker until the last two years, ever since the end of World War II. So, that, so again, that gives you a context of how remarkable it is now, because the, the labor movement has bitterly learned over the last 70 years that if you look like you're at all sympathetic to socialism, uh, if you talk in language that makes conservatives suspect you, then they will do damage to your union. It means that the unions become self-policing in terms of squashing the militants, mm -hmm. persuading them to leave the union, or to give up their militants, or not to be, and the unions become sluggish. Their leadership becomes conservative rather than, uh, and that is all exploding now. That the, And the reason is simple, although very controversial here in the United States, but it is, and this is now my opinion, my, my analysis. I should mention to you, I was born in the United States. I have lived all my life here in the United States. I've been a professor of economics. I have been very interested in the labor movement, one of the topics I cover and so forth. But what we have in the United States is a growing awareness, which is part of why we have an upsurge of the labor movement a growing awareness that the American empire is now in a period of decline. That basically the second half of the 19th century and the 20th century were the rise to dominance of the American empire, which took over that role from the British Empire, who had it before. As people in India know probably better than anyone else what I'm talking about. And now the American Empire is following the British Empire, which has been declining for a century. The United States is now doing that too. And American capitalism is also having increasing difficulties. And because of the difficulties of American capitalism, the empire declines. And because the empire declines, that produces difficulties for the American capitalist system. And all of those difficulties are being avoided by the powerful and the rich and offloaded onto the mass of the people. We have seen, for example, a radical redistribution of wealth here in the United States over the last 40 years, from the bottom and the middle to the top. We have all the wealth concentrating at the top, and life is becoming difficult for people in the middle and the bottom. And because there is no mass-based analysis of this problem, no honest discussion, partly because of the taboo on critical thinking about capitalism that began in 1945 as the push against the New Deal, for example, I had to learn my Marxism on my own 
even though I am a product of Harvard, Stanford, and Yale, the only institutions I attended, the elite. It's the Oxford and Cambridge of England. It's in, you know New Delhi in your country, and so on. Uh, I could never learn any Marxism. The courses I had would not offer that. It was taboo. And so those of us who want to use that theoretical framework had to go do that on on their own. I had to find teachers. I had to find similarly interested students. And together, we could study and read and so on. So the country as a whole has not had a chance to discuss, to, to open up what were the factors that redistributed wealth. Many Americans don't know that wealth was redistributed. They feel it, they see bits of it, but they don't have a way of understanding it. It was done by changing the tax laws in this country. It was done by the absence of a labor movement that therefore could not affect the wages and the contracts that workers, workers had fought for earlier. Early. So that's why you get strange ideas. You get conspiracy theories that the great danger to the American working class, for example, are hordes of poor people trying to become immigrants coming into the country uh, from Latin America or from Asia or Africa. You know, a kind of horrible anti-immigrant scapegoating or you have the re the return to this country after all these years of another movement of white supremacy, literally people once again imagining that their whiteness is some sort of ticket that they deserve to be in a dominant position and they don't want to give or share that with people whose skin color is brown or black or, or I mean, just childish return, though, of somebody to blame, uh, you know, and it means that you are going to fight a war uh, against brown or black people wherever you get the chance. Desperate wars that the United States with a declining empire can no longer win. The United States, let's remember, was defeated in Vietnam, was defeated in Afghanistan, was defeated in Iraq, is currently being defeated in Ukraine. These are realities that you can pretend aren't there, which many Americans do, but it keeps eating at the people here and now, in the last two or three years, a remarkable development. The left wing is reemerging to take advantage of this troubled capitalism with its declining structure, its declining empire, by saying, we need unions and going to masses of people deeply worried about their jobs, their incomes, their futures, and saying you will be stronger and better off if you form a union. And the masses of Americans are responding. And it is everywhere. It is, not, it is your, you mentioned the United Auto Workers. That's a powerful union, a traditionally powerful union right. located in the automobile industry. But we're seeing unionizing drives among the people who make your coffee at the Starbucks coffee shop, among public employees of all kinds, among graduate students in universities. We've never seen that before. I mean, uh, just last week in my mm -hmm. alma mater, where I got my PhD at Yale University, finally, after years of effort, though 
graduate students at Yale won, and they now have a union. And they are one of many, many uh, graduate students, public employees, uh, workers at Amazon, you know, who move packages. I could go on and on. Computer workers, highly educated, minimally educated. The union movement now is very, very powerful. I'll give you just one example. The uh, chief executive, uh, in many ways, the founder of the Starbucks empire, Howard Schultz by name, had to quit. Second time he's had to quit his own company. This last time he was thrown out because he made the mistake of speaking loudly and crudely against the unionization drive. And the unionization drive only became more successful when he opened his mouth. He repeatedly opened his mouth, and it had the exact opposite effect of what he intended, and they threw him out. Mm -hmm. And he's been replaced now, and they, the Starbucks is talking about cooperating with unions. I have no idea whether this is genuine. Nobody does. We will see. But what's happening is unmistakable. Hundreds of Starbucks have been unionized in just the last two years, hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. Now there are thousands of them, so the work is still to be done. But is it possible? Absolutely. Are people joining unions who haven't done so for decades? Absolutely. I, with my gray hair, I tried to organize graduate <laughs> students at Yale University Person. when I was I like one. And look, and look at this many years, but now it's happening. So I think you're going to see the effects of this, just to give you an idea, that play out over decades. Because graduate students who have had to struggle throughout their whole graduate education to get a decent stipend, to be able to live so that they could pass their exams and prepare themselves who have been victorious in building their own union, they are going to be very different from the teachers we all had. They're going to understand something our teachers didn't. They're going to have passions that our teachers couldn't imagine. And they are going to change the next generation in the same direction. So what we're watching is a very long term process that you cannot undo once it gets underway. And I'm glad to tell you, it is now underway. I want to quickly follow up, even though like, you know, it has gone uh, for so long, I also have other questions to ask, but very quickly, since this is like also uh, an election time, but also since so much of the discussion is around the New Deal, uh, one of the landmarks of the New Deal was the labor movement being able to exert its power through uh, the unions onto the state and eventually, you know, uh, bargain with the political parties. Yeah. In the US, we saw these attempts in 2016 and 2020, but it, like during this phase of primaries, we are not seeing a lot of that. Even like someone like Sean Fain, they have not endorsed Biden and for good reasons. So there seems to be a, a, a gap there, uh, especially during this uh, cycle of election. The labor movement seems to be somewhat at a distance from where the electoral politics is going on. And a big debate within the US left, as you would know, is whether there is a way out through third party or whether it's supporting Biden over Trump. And this this seems to have divided some of the Sanders movement. And this, this is a big debate, you know, people on, on the left lean either side. What are your thoughts on it? Do you do you vote the Democrats or do you don't vote? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Yes. Um, 
because of what happened after World War II, <clears throat> enormous pressure was put on labor unions to disconnect from their partnership, their coalition with socialists and communists. And therefore, they either threw out the socialists and communists or required them to be socialists personally, privately, and secretly, but not mingle the two. And loyalty to the United States um, was the dominant criterion. In that situation, the, uh, the alliance that had happened so clearly in the 1930s between the labor movement and the Democratic Party because of Biden was steadily eroded. The, the working class always voted Democratic because it was so obvious in the Great Depression. Democrats were your friend and the Republicans were your enemy that it became almost second nature. But the Democratic Party systematically lost the support of the working class because it could not, it wasn't a matter of not advancing workers' needs. They couldn't even protect what had been achieved in the 1930s, which is what the working class wanted. To give you just one example, the minimum wage in this country is currently $7.25 per hour at the federal level. <clears throat> that was last raised to that, to $7.25, in the year 2009. There has been no increase in the minimum wage since 2009. <laughs> Meanwhile, the prices have risen at least 20%, and the prices of food and so on, even more than 20% since 2009, which means the real value of the minimum wage has fallen by 20% or more. Oh, that's an unbelievable abuse of the poorest workers in the society, the Democratic Party could not protect them, even when the Democratic Party controlled the presidency and controlled both houses of the Congress. They did not. Why? Because the Democratic Party, in the, in a way, responding to the decline of unions, and remember, it used to be the unions that provided the mass ground support for the Democratic Party. But if you destroy the unions, they don't have as many staff people. They can't help you in each district. So the irony was the Democratic Party, who helped to destroy the labor movement, had to turn instead to wealthy donors. And so that's you have now the situation where wealthy donors support the Republican Party and wealthy donors support the Democratic Party. Conservative wealthy donors support the Republican. Liberal wealthy donors support the Democrats. But there's no labor, that there's no basis for much of an agreement. And that is why one of the <laughs> reasons why you had a Bernie Sanders who steps into that vacuum. Here is somebody who will advance labor's agenda much more than the Republicans or the Democrats will dare to do. But now the question is, are we ready for either the Democratic Party to be captured once again by the progressive leftist population or not. And that's where the left splits right now. Many of us, like me, were disappointed that Bernie Sanders went back into 
the Democratic mm -hmm. Party rather than stay on his own. He is the best opposition to Trump that the Democrats have, and an awful lot of Democrats know it. But whether or not there would be a shift of the donors, the wealthy donors who would stop giving to the Democrats if they put forward someone like Bernie and go to the Republicans, that's probably a risk. And the middle of the road Democrats, the machine, the people like Biden or Obama or Clinton, they don't want to make that ever. They don't agree with the progressives anyway, and they don't want to take that chance. And that's where we are uh, politically. But I would I would draw the attention of people that are interested that there are at least three candidates for president who are ready to go further. One of them is Marianne Williamson, who's running inside the Democratic Party. Uh, and then there are two that are running outside, Cornell West and uh, Jill Stein. Mm -hmm. And yes, they are not going to win. And yes, they are small, underfunded efforts. But they are there and they are a sign that there are, as everybody knows, millions of Americans who feel very unrepresented. I mean, the polling now shows that it's probable that a majority of our voters do not want either Trump or Biden in polling. That's how bad it is. And that tells you something, no matter what the official outcome is, you're now watching the implosion of the American political system. And I, I, I don't I don't say that lightly. That that mm -hmm. is the reality of that we're holding. And people think the danger comes from Mr. Trump. The irony is that that's only half true. The most dangerous scenario for this society is a victory by Mr. Trump, not because of what he will do, but because of what the opposition to, to him, him will, will be, be and what it will do if he wins. That's, that's a society disintegrating. Mm -hmm. And this, this country has no experience with that. And you're going to see very bizarre activity in this society. Remember, we are the most armed country in the earth on earth. Everybody has guns in their garage and everybody lives in a culture in which these guns are used. So that's what I would worry about politically. Yes, that's something so so unique i would say it's it's more like an american culture i mean i remember reading this jesuit priest in the 16th century called Matteo ricci he went to china and and this was the period where gunpowder was coming up and so people were having guns in europe and he wrote back saying this is an incredible society because you know people are not necessarily very rich but they don't have guns so that he he was surprised and that's something of a maturity moment that i feel when i talk to my friends from the whole of america like including mexico central america i mean obviously you know the the, the history is much more complicated but uh i feel that the american continent is quite unique in terms of its gun ownership, which you don't see in in Asia, uh, maybe some parts of Africa torn by civil war, but 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 nowhere near close to. Yeah, and and you have to remember that it's here; it exists in a peculiar way. The gun is a symbol. The gun is a fantasy. The gun 
is pretense. This is a population in which people do not participate politically. They haven't participated meaningfully politically in a long time. They have a gun in order to protect themselves against a danger that's mostly imaginary. You know, the real danger to them is that they're going to lose their job or they're going to lose their home or they're going to lose their income. And the gun isn't going to help them with any of those things. And they, But they can't face that because then they have nothing. Then they are waiting for the disaster, which keeps, seems to keep coming closer. So they buy a gun and they feel somehow magically better protected. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it, it's not as though they understand what to do or how to do it. You know, if they ever use the gun, I'm sure they'll be shooting their relatives, their neighbors, their friends without meaning to just lost in the confusion between what is the problem and what this gun can do for them. So it's a very bizarre uh, situation. Right. It's extraordinary when you talk to someone from Cuba or and probably yeah. Chile, like they would say there are no guns, but, you know, most of yeah. Let's uh, switch gear very quickly. Um, uh, I had a lot many questions, but let's stick to uh, China very quickly because um, the, the, the Financial Times, uh, you know, are they, they, they're reporting so much about deflationary trends in Chinese economy, about high levels of unemployment. Some of these things are not untrue at all. Uh, the problem with the real estate driven uh, economy post 2008, the problem with leverage spending, credit, uh, debts with the local government and so on and so forth. And the prediction is that that 5% growth may not be sustainable and so on and so forth. I was wondering how do you look at some uh, some of the things that uh, the Chinese economy is facing? Sure. Uh, let me begin by urging you to do what I do, which is if you read the Financial Times about China and if you read the New York Times about China, as I have been doing, for at least 25 years, you will recognize that 95% of the stories about China are about something in China that is wrong or <laughs> bad or <laughs> negative or dangerous or risky. It never stops. And that's a proof. That, and I use that word carefully. That's a proof that this is mostly propaganda. That doesn't mean that there isn't some truth here and there. I'm sure there is. You know, there's something going on. But the way it is handled is childish. You know, it's beyond credibility to the point where I, I mean, I read the stories, but I don't. I, I, if I were you, don't worry about that. Uh if you're able, do some hard research. And one of the places to start is that there's a good bit of literature now available from a variety of sources inside and outside China that are not busy doing propaganda, that are trying to understand the strategy of their, of their credit system or uh, what, why they are doing what they are doing with housing and whatever it is. Um, and then you get a picture that will be somewhere more realistic. Here's the bottom line in my judgment. For at least 30 years, the annual increase in GDP of the People's Republic of China has grown in the neighborhood of six to nine percent. During this same period, 
the average rate of growth of the GDP of the United States has been between two and three percent. Okay, that's the bottom line. That's why China is now the economic powerhouse that it has become. It's easy to show you arithmetically that if you're two to you're growing two to three times faster than another country, it's only a matter of time before you catch up. What we would have been saying to each 20, 20 years, years ago or 30 years ago will, would have been, can they sustain this? Because if they can't sustain it, well, then, it, then it's a very different story. But they've sustained it almost without interruption. Even this year, the GDP growth in the United States will be two, two and a half percent, and that in China, five, five and a half percent. All right. It's this less is, of a gap. This is especially less... when the US economy is said to be doing well and, and the Chinese economy yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. You read all the time. I look, I'm sitting in New York City, I'm sitting in Manhattan talking to you. I read every day how great the American economy is. The same people who tell me that are upset because the mass of the American people keep telling pollsters the economy is a disaster, the economy is a disaster, and, and, and they keep writing articles about how stupid the people are not to see, look how low the unemployment rate is or whatever. you know. And I have to explain to people that an economy always uh, shows different statistics. Some point up, some point down. It's like going to the doctor. You don't go to the doctor and he looks in your ear and your nose. No, he looks in your ear, your nose. Then he takes some blood. Then he gives you an x-ray. In other words, the trick is not to find a statistic that makes you look good or a statistic that makes you look bad. It's to gather the relevant statistics it's and then make, make a judgment sense. about it all. What you have here is it's great. Why? Unemployment is low. That's stupid. That's just, that's pure propaganda noise. Yeah, but we have the worst inequality we've had probably in the country's history. What about that? We have the first real economic competitor in a century. China is a competitor. Let me give you an example. The GDP of the United States last year, $23 trillion. The GDP of Russia, our great enemy in the Ukraine, one and a half trillion. Okay, again, US 23 trillion, Russia one and a half trillion. Before you bullshit me about what's going on, try to get your head around what that means. China's GDP, depending on how you count, 17, 18 trillion dollars. There's a competitor. Still not the US, but getting there and getting there fast. And that that is what the reality is, not what you know. And that's been, look, they've overbuilt housing for many years. Their strategy is to build the housing before they have the people to put in it. Okay, you can raise questions about that strategy. That can be a pro, but it's just a strategy. It doesn't mean that because there are houses without people in it, therefore they're in trouble. That misunderstands what the logic is. They're moving hundred, hundreds of millions of people off of the countryside into the cities of China. That's what they're doing. And they're trying to do it in much less time than that has taken anywhere else in the world. And you know that means they're going to be doing different things. You have to use a standard of evaluation relevant to the strategic plan that governs what they do. This is never done. What, what, uh, what stupid here in America, stupid economists do is they measure what's happening in China 
against the standards that exist in the West. Right. But that's, you know, that's that makes it makes them feel very good. China's full of troubles. Here's my guess. China has troubles. China has serious problems. One of them is that China has decided, at least so it looks, to hold on to the model of organization of enterprises such that you have employers and employees. Okay, that's, that's the typical the capitalist, capitalist model. You distinguish capitalism from feudalism because capitalism is employer-employee, not lord-serf. You distinguish capitalism from slavery because capitalism has employer-employee, not master-slave. Okay, if socialism is the rejection of capitalism, is the going beyond capitalism. And if the, the Chinese are sincere in understanding themselves to be a socialism with Chinese characteristics, well, then a question would be, why are you holding on to the employer-employee organization and then the more important question, question. could okay. that organization be at the root of some of the problems you are encountering so that the solution to those problems requires a reorganization of the workplace? Okay, that's the kind of question I would ask and I would look at the credit structure, the housing structure, the labor market structure with that, but not to use standards from the United States. That makes no sense. And again, it, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of childish and it's becoming fast becoming irrelevant. The Chinese now have shown their ability not just to outgrow the United States, but to match or exceed the most technologically advanced breakthroughs that the United States is able to make, the Chinese are able to do the same or better. Uh, we have, you know, Amazon and we have Apple and, and we have Intel, but they have the equivalent. Right. So, I mean, the reality is what we ought to be talking about, if I can end this with a with a historical example. Once upon a time, North America was a minor colonial property of the British Empire. Then at a certain point, the settler colonialism of the United States wanted to break away from the British Empire become independent. King George III at that time in Britain didn't yeah, want that. that. So we so had we a had war, war, the War of Independence, 1776 or whatever the hell it was, um, which the Spain, British, British Empire lost. In 1812, the British Empire tried again and it lost again. At the time of the American Civil War in the 1860s, the British seriously considered siding with the slave South against the anti-slave. They didn't do it, but they thought about it. Thereafter, once the South was defeated, <clears throat> no more wars. The British quietly watched because they couldn't stop it, the decline of their empire and the rise of the Americans as the next empire. Okay, the real question about China is, will the United States remember its own history, avoid the two wars, 
avoid taking sides in an internal Chinese struggle, you know, the one over Taiwan, and make a deal and work it out, live and let live the American economy quietly passing out and the Chinese either becoming the new empire or, and this is something the United States never considered, not becoming an empire, making the relationship with India and the rest of the BRICS a group takeover of the world economy that we have never seen before and that I have no way of imagining because it's it's genuinely new and original. And maybe it will avoid war more successfully than the empires so far have been able to do. No. Those, Those are the are really the interesting and globally important questions. Because if the United States continues to theorize, to think about China in the propagandistic and aggressive way that it has, then we're heading more likely for war. And these are two nuclear countries, and we all know where that might leave us if that's the direction change takes. Professor Wolf, you have been extremely generous with your time. I just want to end on one uh, note, like you can just answer in one line if you wish, since you have been already generous. Um, people from my generation, we grew up after the fall of the Soviet Union. And unlike you, for us as leftists, even though we believe in a post-capitalist world, it's almost impossible sometimes to imagine about a world where it's something beyond capitalism. I mean, for, I guess, those who grew up in the 50s and 60s had easier time to imagine about a post-capitalist world because, well, there were blocks which were non-capitalists, clearly, and there were blocks even where, like, Keynesian welfare state, whatever, it didn't never, it, it, it didn't resemble what capitalism ought to be. What do you have to tell to our generation who, as leftists, always struggle to think about a world which is post-capitalist? My advice to you, and my apologies for the brevity, my advice to you, and I'm going to use the language of my field, economics, my advice to you is to be a little less macroeconomic and a good bit more microeconomic. And here's what I mean. The socialist models of the 20th century whether you take the Soviet Union in 1917 and the Soviet socialist model, which is one, or you take the Scandinavian, Western European notions of socialism, that is a different model, or you take the, the Chinese, which is a hybrid of those first two. It's got, you know, half its economy is government owned and operated a la the Soviet Union, and half of it is private, regulated by a powerful socialist government. That's more like Scandinavia or Western Europe. Those models are all focused macroeconomically. It's all about the state versus the private sector. It's all about planning, about the big picture, you know, the economy as a whole. What those socialisms did not question in general, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm simplifying, was the internal micro-level organization of the enterprise, the factory, the office, the store, in which a small group of people, employers, who could be private citizens, who could be government officials, make a decision for a mass of people that are employees. My idea, and I see it coming here in the United States, is that in this century, the 21st century, the focus, not exclusively, but the focus 
will be on the transition from the top-down hierarchical structure of the enterprise, internal, to a horizontal, equal, egalitarian community at the workplace. The way we the way we phrase it here, the democratization of the workplace is the socialism of the 21st century. That the it's not a rejection of planning and uh, government and none of that. It is an attempt to see the limits, the flaws, and the failures of that socialism in order to figure out what is the next step. And for us, one way to get at many of the flaws, not all of them, but many, is to say to the working class, you fought hard for the, the socialism of the last century. You fought hard in the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, and so on. As did socialists in countries that didn't have such revolutions. Now you have to fight for something more immediately about you, your daily life in the workplace. As adults, you go to work five or more days a week, eight to five in the day. You give your brains, your muscles. You do that, and it will be a transformed reality if you are the employer as well as the employee if there aren't other people designing, controlling, supervising, and telling you what to do. You have to step up in your own head, in your education. You have to take leadership together with others in a community run democratically. And now comes the push. Only if that is your reality on the job will you develop the appetite and the demand to have an equivalent position in the community where you live. We now have democracy only in the form. We go, we vote. It's not real and we know it. To make it real, it has to be real in the economic foundation. It should never have been banished. Capitalism banishes democracy in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Doesn't want it, doesn't admit it. When I make speeches in the United States and I say, how can we be the champion of democracy when we do not allow it in the workplace where the majority of our adult population spend the majority of their life? That's a ridiculous. We aren't a vehicle of democracy. Nobody has a refutation. Nobody, even when I'm on panels with people who hate socialism or Marxism, what are they going to say? There is no refutation. I, and democracy has been given a quasi-religious standing as a value. Okay, socialism is the democratization of the workplace. I think that is a way to give some direction, some clarity, some objective to the people of your, of your generation in terms of carrying the transition to socialism, the crucial next step. Some of these ideas are so well laid in one of the books uh, that you, you have written and I read. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. You have been more than generous with your time. And it was such a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Uh, well, wish you good health. Hi, my name is Ayushman. I, along with Jyotisman, have started this platform. In the last two years, we have tried to build content for the left and progressive forces. We have interviewed economists, historians, political commentators, and activists so far. If you have liked our content so far and want us to build an archive for the left, I have two requests for you. Please do consider 
donating for the cause link is in the description below also if you are not able to do so don't feel sad you can always like our videos and share our videos to your comrades finally don't forget to hit the subscribe button